Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 303. Uh, This week, we've got not one, but three guests on the show. Uh, Black belt Byron Jabara, brown belt uh, Gary Hall, and purple belt Joe Thomas. We're going to be our own guests this week. It's a topical episode, and we're going to be talking about why we're not getting submissions when we're doing jujitsu. Uh, Byron, Gary, how are you guys doing today? You know, I'm doing great, and I like it. The three guests you have today, it actually saves the podcast money because uh, <laughs> we don't have to pay their guests uh, anything. We've we've actually never paid a guest, and and uh, I've a couple times ran into somebody who wanted payment for interview, and they just promptly turned that down. <laughs> so every, anybody we've had on the show has has done so, uh, you know, very graciously. <laughs> Including we, Joe and Gary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we are a nonprofit organization. Well, I wouldn't say we're trying to make a little money on the side. <laughs> yeah, that's not by but choice. We're also a but... podcast, yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't crank it in either. Uh, we'll have to figure out what category we fall into, Gary. <laughs> yeah. But we Key do fall into the category of trying to help into. people get better at jujitsu and enjoy jujitsu as well. We do fall into that category. Yeah, and one way we could do that is by producing some content that would help them along their journey. Maybe some audio books. Uh, Byron's actually got a couple of good ones out. He's got six games for BJJ and your first year in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Byron, I think that's a good one to talk about this uh, week. Um, our article is about white belts. And so let's talk about your first year in Jiu-Jitsu. Byron, what's that book all about? Yeah, that. So if you enjoy uh, like audio content for jiu-jitsu, which is much like a podcast, you're going to really love this, especially if you're you're newish to jiu-jitsu. Your first year of jiu-jitsu, I walk you through uh, everything you're going to expect and, and kind of run into and, and the different things with jiu-jitsu in your first year. It's basically, if I got to sit down with you and talk to you for two and a half hours about, about starting jiu-jitsu, this is what the conversation would be like. Uh, everything from finding your first gym, your first couple of months, uh, you know what techniques you should be working on, even up to doing a tournament if you're interested in that. So it's eleven ninety nine. Uh, the money goes to help support the show and uh, try to make this thing, this brick float, a little bit better. But uh, it's it's been I've heard, we've heard great feedback from uh, the listeners who have got it and uh, and benefited from it. And I just I think about how difficult it could be to start jujitsu and to, to be off to a good start and kind of understand some of the main concepts and, and find some uh, different enjoyable parts of jujitsu. And I think this book will help you do that. Yeah. If I would have had this book when I started jujitsu, my first no gi class probably would have been a lot less embarrassing. So, Oh, I think um, like there's a story there. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, wait, wait, now we've got to hear the story, Joe. Uh, come on guys. You know how it is. Show up and you're like, uh, this is gi, so this must be no gi. And sometimes uh, your ideas don't match up with everybody else's. <laughs> anyway, if you're in your first year of jiu-jitsu, go ahead and buy that book and uh, you'll greatly benefit from it. If you're not in your first year, buy it for somebody else. It's almost Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in May. <laughs> We're not sure how the uh, calendar works here yeah. on this podcast. It's just... <laughs> It's just right around the corner. Yeah. Uh, what's next around the corner is our off the mat lesson. You know, every every podcast we like to have like a quote and an article, and we've been doing this off the mat lesson where we kind of bring something uh, from the non jujitsu world and, and bring it into the jujitsu world. And in mine's a, I guess, a self defense lesson um, that I ran into get, at work. Did you get in a fight, Byron? I did not. Okay. That's the I main part you. of the of the. Of the situation, ah, okay. <laughs> I did not get into a fight, so I'm a I'm a firefighter, and we got a call for a house fire, and it was actually in a 
in a quadplex. So there's, if you're not familiar with what a quadplex is, it's like four people live in the same little building, and uh, and they all have their separate doors. And so it's really a lot of potential for uh, quite a big problem if, if the fire gets into the attic. Or, or There's a lot of different problems that could happen. But quadplex, a lot of people can be involved in this. And we, we get told on the way to the fire that we uh, might want to stand off and wait for the police to get to the scene first, which is unusual. It's not unheard of. And, and we're trying to figure out why, why are the dispatcher telling us to stand off? Like, we got, you just said, hey, it's cool. uh, you know, Engine 12, you might stand off before you get there. And we're like, what is up with this? So we contacted our, our chief, and he says, you know, go in and see, kind of see what we have. So we drive up. There's nothing showing out of the house. No smoke. No, you can't even smell it. So, uh, and I see a lady on the phone. I get out. And I, say, I say, what's going on? Could you call 911? She says, yeah, my brother's trying to light the house on fire. I said, are, I said, is he armed? Does he have any weapons? She said, no. And so I have all my gear on, my, you know, air pack and, and full gear and, and uh, some tools as well. And I go up to the front door and I kind of crack it and look into the, the door and I open it up. And there's a guy standing there. He looks pretty crazy. He's, he's high on uh, some, some pretty hard drugs. And he's holding a knife and he's cussing at me. <laughs> he's like 15, maybe 20 feet away. And I go, I, I go, put the knife down. And he, he cusses at me or something. I, I don't remember really what I yelled. It happened pretty quick. I was like, I'm done. Close the door. And, and, I, and I leave the front of the house and I walk to, the, to like the street. And so as other units are coming into this fire, which isn't really a fire, you know, not much, I tell anybody, hey, he's got a knife. We're staying back. And the cops get in and, and they uh, get him under control. They don't hurt anybody. It worked out pretty good. But it's just my – so I have things I think that help me in life is in situations that kind of go fast like that. I'm not, I don't want to fight anybody with a knife ever. So it could have been like anybody behind that, open that door with the holding a knife. I'm done. And this is like, you know, maybe they were actively hurting somebody else. Some of that maybe, but a guy threatening me with a knife and he wants to, to start a fire or maybe cut himself or like, I'm leaving that situation. That's not a fight for me because I'm under the impression of if you get into a fight with somebody holding a knife, you both get cut. Like, I don't want to get cut. <laughs> Even and, and people were were standing in the front lawn waiting for the police to get there. And people were like, aren't you, don't you jujitsu or something? And, and can't you go in there and take care of it? I'm like, I don't fight people with knives. Not going to happen. And it, it was it's just a simple thing I already have in my head. I'm not going to do this. You know, if he charged at me, it would be a different situation. But why would I engage this this person? And so I think in in jujitsu or anything in life that if you can kind of think about something before it happens, you get a way better start at uh, answering the problem correctly. Because I thought about it, if I am encountered with another person with a knife, I'm going to not fight that person the best that I can. You know, avoid, avoid, and and try to try to not make this thing not happen. I've been in several little fights at work. Nobody's ever been had a knife on me. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. It's, it's that go or no-go, and, and that's a no-go if at all possible. And I think, you know, on the mats, you could, like, you know, think about, you know, if I get mounted, what am I going to do? Well, I have to do this and do that. It, or if I get put in this weird situation or this, my opponent is really good at, uh, like, deep half guard. I'm not familiar with that. What am I going to do? I need to have some ideas of what to do in case this happens to me. And it gives you better answers uh, more quickly. Off the mat, too, anything in life. Like, what would happen if, you know, if if you're sick today, what would you be, you know, who would you call or, or you know, these these sort of things. I don't know. Just If you just occasionally think about what ifs, but don't stress yourself and just have an answer. And to me, that makes me uh, more relaxed and more confident that when things pop up, they're easier to handle. Thank you, Byron. That's a scary situation there, uh, what you ran into. Um, hey, real quick, like, how? what about your, you said you had your full gear on, like, would it be easy to stab through that gear? I don't, know? so I, I don't know, it's puncture resistant, okay. um, he had like a large kitchen knife, Ooh. and I, you know what, I'm, I would, thinking about it now, I bet I would yeah. get, be getting cut minimum on the hands, because yeah. how, how do you not try to block, and, block something who's swinging something at you, like, just yeah. naturally, um, yep. I also had your, had an axe with me and a, and a halogen bar, which are two significant tools to do. I mean, could have done a lot of damage. The, the, this guy had 
is having problems. Like, yeah, he, you don't he's, want him he, to get he's off his rocker. <laughs> like, yeah. he's high as as a kite. Yep. He tried to he tried to light the carpet on fire. He tried to light some some other furniture on fire that luckily didn't burn, and uh, it, it it worked out for the best. But um, I don't know if yeah. that would. I, I I wasn't willing to rely on that to work yeah. for me. No, I, I wasn't saying yeah. to fight it. I was just curious, like, would that work? Because I think you did the right thing, but definitely by far. And really kind of what showed me, too, is uh, when uh, you stood off and you waited for the, the police to show and every your buddies all started making fun of you, you know. And, and you, <laughs> they no, just, they, that, well, that's how we are. That, like, we just yeah. we just give each other, kind of like here on the podcast, you know, you just kind of tend to dish it out a little bit. Can't you go in there and take care of this guy? <laughs> like, no, I cannot. <laughs> no, but you know me, I'm a hothead. And, and I probably would have jumped in when somebody starts making fun of me like that. You know, it just showed the, the type of person you are. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a really scary situation right there. I mean, you're in a no win situation. You don't want to, uh, hurt yourself. You don't want to hurt him. But the one thing I was thinking of, you were talking about your, your gear is puncture resistant, but you know, he could still cut you on the face or whatever. But the nice thing is any damage to your face, you would end up being better looking. Yeah. It's so, not getting much worse. Is yeah. It? yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it also kind of reminds me, like you said, there, there's a no-win situation in that. You know, think about it beforehand. And, and you guys know I used to do fights to the death all the time. And my record for fights to the death is 12 wins, 7 losses, and 13 ties in fights to the death. And now, you know, I start thinking over, there's no way you're going to win on that. So uh, you're better off just thinking about it and, uh, and not doing it because, I mean, who wants to die 7 times and tie 13? That, yeah, that's the, the stats are bad on that. Gary, if it's a fight to the death and it's a tie, does that mean you both lived or you both died? Oh, definitely. Good question. No, we both died. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so you didn't just die seven times, man. You died like twenty some odd times then. <laughs> yeah, but thirteen of them were ties. Okay, so yeah. so, it, long- so it was an honorable death. At least you weren't dying in a loss. I guess I guess you could say that. Yeah. I guess you could say that. So it, it, you, at home, everyone's picturing different ways of, of these death matches. What they really are is they're, they're groin kicking competitions to the death. So Gary has basically <laughs> been destroyed. <laughs> I can't have kids anymore. Uh, but now that he's aware of the uh, Diamond MMA uh, Super Cup, he, he, uh, might have a better cha- <laughs> he might have a better chance of uh, surviving some of these death matches. Yep. Hey, check out our episode a couple weeks back with the Diamond MMA Makeup. Uh, great product. Well, speaking of great products, we have a Chinese product to peddle. Well, wait a minute. Uh, Joe, wait a minute. Think about this. Uh, think about uh, being told about something like uh, like we have or experiencing it like Gary has, uh, saving uh, certain parts I of it. I understand. Yeah, involve <laughs> me and I'll understand it. Uh, so, what is this Chinese proverb, Joe? Yeah, tell me, I forget, show me, I remember, involve me, I understand. And I think, uh, I don't think this is necessarily a new concept. Anybody listening, we all kind of understand that there's a learning process. And for most of us, it involves with, uh, you know, gathering some information, like think about learning jiu-jitsu, move the coach, he'll stand there and he'll he'll explain what he's going to do and and talk a little bit about it, give you some information, then he'll show you. And then uh, he'll have everybody work on the move. And that's actually the three phases here. And if you skip that last one where you actually work on the move and you actually physically encounter it and execute it, uh, the first two are not going to do you a whole lot of good. At least that's the way I understand this. How about you, Gary? You know, this one's big to me right here. Um, you know, I have a, I, I learn very slow. I do not do very well just reading a book and you know looking at the pictures and watching the move I don't do very well somebody telling me the move and trying to figure out in my head and really the way I learn and and when I was earlier in my career I would watch YouTube videos and or you know I'd buy the books I'm sorry this was kind of even before there was a lot of YouTube stuff out there but I'd buy the book and I would look at the pictures of you know this submission I'd buy grappling magazine and and you know look it over numerous times but without my coach sitting there walking me through and involving me in it I always had a hard time with it and so I realized that I learned best and so I I actually kind of threw threw away the books I I would just use the books if I wanted to go back and look at something that we had learned in class a little you know little technique or something to make that the position tighter 
But um, yeah, I definitely need to be involved. Uh, if you involve me, I'll understand it. Uh, you know, you need to show me. I'll remember it. So uh, those last two are the big ones for me. Yeah, I, I would slightly move these a little bit for jujitsu because, uh, like, tell me, I, I look at that and I think of it not just tell me, but more as as a show me category already because we're showing techniques in jujitsu and um, it's so easy to sit and, and watch technique. If you just stood in and watched the technique portion of the class and got up and left, that would be like the tell me I forget category. Show me I remember would be like, uh, let me try it. Like, let me let me feel this. Let me get a, get a hold of it, and then involve me. Uh, I understand. That's when you try to bring it into your game, and you and you try to um, make it more practical against other people, and and to see how it works. And you run into problems, and you have questions. Like, I think when people are asking questions, they're involved in something. So it feels really good as an instructor if you're showing something, and somebody asks a good question. They don't just kind of uh, ask. You know, I don't know. Some questions feel better. Some some questions people ask, uh, it entails that they understand what you're trying to teach already, and they and they have a, a deeper problem or a deeper uh, quest for that knowledge or that category, or whatever. So it really is like, okay, this person gets it. Uh, like like okay, I'm showing arm bars, and like I can't. How come I can't get my leg like over their their head from my arm bar from guard? Okay, maybe it's your angle, and so the the person like recognizes a lot of the movements for the armbar, but they're having a problem controlling the elbow. Well, can control the elbow by controlling uh, you know the distance from their body uh, to your ears, or you control their head better, and the elbow will be stuck. There's different concepts, but I think when they um, the understanding, the involve me, I understand part is is trying to bring it into your game, and that's a deeper understanding of each technique. So, yep, for sure. And everybody knows now when uh, Byron says there are no dumb questions that um, he doesn't necessarily believe that he values some questions more than others. <laughs> the, 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 occasionally, he's <laughs> like, "That's a really good question." Or when somebody asks something, and the whole class is like, "Yeah, what about that?" You know? Okay, I forgot to explain this. <laughs> there are dumb instructors too, because you know you could forget something pretty important, or a lot of the class will, uh, you know, be left out, and and a question that may seem dumb may be very valuable to a lot of people. Yeah. Well, that's why it's so important to uh, bring up questions. I mean, the question that you are going to ask, probably a lot of people are thinking about it, but may for some reason be afraid to ask because your instructor is going to miss stuff. I mean, nobody is 100% perfect and you have it in your mind. You've taught it numerous times, but, uh, you know, for some reason, this time you taught it, you left out that part. So uh, don't ever be afraid to ask questions. That's how we get better. Yeah, I I like it when... uh you know, somebody says, well, what happens if my opponent inverts while rotating and hooks my far armpit with his big toe? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I was wondering. (laughs) (laughs) Joe, you know me and you don't invert. We don't even know what that is. Not on purpose anyway. Yeah. That's the key word there, Byron, on purpose. Well, I don't have, I don't have any uh, submissions from an inverted guard so that's definitely not someplace i'm going uh yeah. speaking of submissions guys are you guys ready to move on to the topic of the week i'm ready to submit this topic byron i guess we're starting with uh why we're not getting submissions Is yeah that the- well why anybody i mean it, it if we have personal stories that's great but um I think it's a common common frustration in jiu-jitsu. I'm not getting submissions. I'm I, I'm grappling. Uh, you know, maybe not getting submitted all the time either. But I just I can't land good submissions the way I, uh, I the way I want to. And uh, who hasn't felt that? I know I have. I guess Gary and uh, Joe have no, not felt Joe that. No, Joe and I we've never felt that. <laughs> well, rolling with you when we roll it with you, Byron. It's pretty easy to, to catch that. stuff. Yeah. But so uh, I, I, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess I could say that uh, I go through periods where I'm not getting submissions, but I don't go through periods where I worry about it too much. And that's, in my personal experience, part of the reason I don't get them. When I'm not getting submissions for weeks on end, it's because it's, I'm not making it a focus. I've got to, you know, get on the mat with a plan that I'm looking for an Ezekiel tonight or I'm looking for a Kimura. A flying triangle, uh, flying arm bars, um, yeah, those kind of things. If I don't go on the mat with a, a goal to get there, I, I tend to just kind of play whatever game is is handed to me by my training partner. And 
So it's something for me I've got to be looking for in order to get. Have you ever tried the landing triangle? Uh, that that can go wrong sometimes. So no, I'm not. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's, it's when you try to do the tr- flying triangle and you just you know flop flat on your back or neck <laughs> and yeah. you land it, <laughs> you land. But uh, the flying part is a little, little lacking. That's what I'm always afraid of. <laughs> it's not the flying part; it's the landing part. But yeah, for for these, uh, we have some basic notes we're going to be talking about today. But uh, I think we could break them into into two main categories about why you're not getting submissions. Obviously, when you want to get submissions, and I, I think we have some advice that. I've, I've given this advice or some of this advice to a lot of white belts and a lot of blue belts, and every time it's worked. So if you're a white belt or a blue belt, and you take and you notes, ta- and you get some of this advice, is is will increase your submission ability. Um, it, it takes a few weeks, maybe even a month or so, but some of these things that you're gonna, if you change them, it, you'll you'll get results, and it's uh, I think I think it'd be, it could make it more enjoyable. It, it is fine to get submissions. Right, Gary? Because Gary is a submission hunter. Submissions are definitely fun. Uh, that's why I train. I like to get submissions. I like to get sweeps. That's the, for me. That's the fun part of uh, jujitsu. As Joe would say, that's what's best about jujitsu. That's what I love most about jujitsu. So, w- breaking these into two categories, we'll talk about your training and we'll talk about your performance, and uh, and 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 kind of break these into that. Uh, so you could look at where you're where you're going here. I think one of the biggest ones with your training is you you don't have any focus, and uh, this is really common in in just to you, you go into class. Joe's showing uh, triangle setups or whatever today. Cool. You go into class, uh, you know, later on the same week, and, and Gary's teaching Kimuras, and then you go in class the, the next week, and and I'm showing you a takedown. It's like that's a hard environment to develop a personalized game as far as if you need to have a, like a goal, like, okay, my overall goal is I want to get a more um, aggressive open guard. And so everything that that I'm doing is working towards that when I'm, when I'm training, when I'm rolling and all these things, I'm thinking, Oh man, I got to open up my guard. got to get more aggressive with that. So just getting, getting some focus, I think is a big deal in, in your training. You know, that's kind of like what Joe was talking about when we first started this topic here is, Joe, you were saying, you know, when you're training, you know, it may not be your goal at a point. You may be working on something else, but, uh, you know, you notice that when you really do focus on getting that submission, you have a, you know, a clear path, uh, you know, where you're going, uh, you know, setting stuff up. It uh, makes a big difference in your submission start hitting. Yeah. One thing I did once at a point when I was actually hitting some submissions, um, I made a little note. <laughs> okay, I made a little... word actually in there. <laughs> Wait, was that the kids' class? <laughs> no, I I realized at one point a year or two, a year and a half or so ago that I wasn't getting a lot of submissions in class and felt like I should be. So I made a, a open the note app on my phone and I wrote and I noted four or five submissions that I thought these these are definitely my game. I should be hitting them. And then each time I went to class, I'd look at those. And after class, I'd put that date next to it if I hit one of those submissions. And I did that for about six months. And so every time I'd go to class, I'd look and I'd be like, I haven't hit this one in a week or two. So that's what I'm focusing on tonight. And uh, so just something I did that really helped. Man, I hope my name's not in that book. You know, it's going to be a rear naked choke and there's going to be Gary and there's going to be like 100, 100 next to it. Arm bar, you know, Gary, 100 next to it. Joe, you've All been beating right. me up. Uh, Beat me up too much. <laughs> it's a Joe slam book. Um, but no, I like that. You know, you, you realize you weren't getting them. You're, you're thinking of, Hey, you're, you're not putting too many submissions out there. If you put too many out there, it's kind of like Byron says, you show up and you learn takedowns one day, you learn Ezekiel choke the next day, you learn a leg lock the next day. You're, you're not getting any focus, but Joe, you know, Hey, sat down, what am I good at? Uh, you know, and, and that's easy for Joe because there's not a lot of stuff Joe's good at, you know, in life or on the mats. Uh, no, nah, I'm just kidding, buddy. But, um, uh, you know, he's like, hey, what am I good at? What do I think are my best moves? And he, he wrote those down. And by writing them down and, and doing what he's good at, 
you know, he's basically holding himself accountable. He's always, it's in his head. So he's thinking about it. So when he's rolling, he has, you know, that clear focus of where he's going to go. You know, I'm looking for this move. This is something I'm good at. And, uh, you know, what path can take me down that road where I can hit this submission. But I think that's an awesome uh, idea right there, Joe. Thanks, man. Yeah, it gives you that that focus that you need. Uh, a lot of times, and it just happened last week, uh, uh, I was training, and, and a lot of times I'll start my match or the, the the rolling session with anything you're working on. Most people say no, you know, just trying to survive or you know whatever. And but I was rolling with this this guy. His name's Tanner, and I say anything you're working on, he goes triangle chokes. I go perfect. Uh, you know, let's play guard. So he put me in his guard, and and and. and uh, you know, I work a little bit. He works a little bit. He gets it set up. He he gets to working on it, and uh, and uh, you know a little bit of pause or critique, and you know finishes. And he has like a couple of the really nice setups. He's a white belt, but man, he's got he's got a good like a triangle. And I just think about if if I'd have pulled guard on him, I'd have never like experienced that part of his game. Just because it was like, or if I pull guard and just tried to smash and get the side control as quick as possible or get to his back. Like that, none of that training would have happened but because uh, Tanner's got focus. He's he's working on triangle chokes. Oh, perfect! And then and just to have uh, you know somebody who is willing to just spend the round of rolling. Not I didn't get any submissions. Didn't even attempt a submission. I had to fight out of triangles the whole time, <laughs> but, uh, or attempted to fight out of these things. And they were getting better as we, as the five minute round went on. He was he was picking up little details because he has a lot of uh, a lot of the mechanics behind it down but that was that was five minutes of triangle training that you could add to his to his log there that he uh that, that i think i think it really worked out well for him and it just when he said triangles i was like all right perfect let's do this let's do work on it. and i'm usually happy to do that with anybody you know if, you, if gary says mount yeah maybe i'll give him a couple minutes of working on mount then i want to actually uh, not get murdered anymore. <laughs> you know, if, if Joe wants to work on passing half guard, I'm good for a couple minutes, but I'm going to get worn out and it's not going to be very fun. <laughs> but a, a lot of times, if you want to work on something, you can just ask and it gives you some, uh, some direction and, and some, a little bit more focus in training. It, I think we, like when Joe was able to write down a few of his, his uh, submissions and, and, and to work on those, he was already working with a base of being able to attempt those submissions. And if you know, if you want to work on triangles, but you have a real hard time holding anybody in your guard for very long, uh, those are two different problems, and they kind of go hand in hand. But if I pass your guard, and then it takes you three minutes to recover, you didn't get much practice. So uh, just just by asking sometimes, I'd like to really work on these triangles. Maybe they'll give you the setup. Maybe they'll give you some help on your setup. Maybe they'll give you some help on your finish. But I think your teammates generally should be very helpful to helping you develop uh, part of your game like that. Yeah, Byron, I really like positional sparring. And uh, one thing I've noticed when I, with a lot of our guests, you know, you, you always ask guests, you know, how do you get so good? How do your team get so good? I hear positional sparring a lot. Um, it seems like uh, that is what separates people, uh, you know, to make them better, you know, makes them better at their move. But, you know, I one thing I always don't like to see is, uh, you know, we learn a move at, at practice and we go over the move and, you know, we do a little positional sparring or whatever. And then we go to our regular roles, you know, regular sparring and nobody ever tries it. You know, I always love the guy who's always trying that move he may start in guard uh just so that he can get a triangle he may end up getting passed quickly and as byron said getting murdered for the next four and a half minutes but i respect that that he got into that position and uh you know tried to put himself in that position and that's how you're going to get better but uh i positional sparring i think is one thing that's going to really help you get better at submissions here you're just taking that little section of where you're going to be in a match that's going to lead you up to that submission and you're just working that over and over again and once you get into that position you know during the match it's you, it's going to make a big difference with all the time you'd spent there yeah i think if you watch a class and it goes from uh demoing the technique and, and drilling the technique and then just straight into open sparring i think you rarely see the move attempted during the sparring session but if you train at a gym where you do the technique, drill a technique, and then you have a couple of rounds of positional sparring starting in the position that that technique 
uh, is executed from, then you're far more likely to see the move attempted during open sparring. It sort of, sort of bridges that gap from um, fairly non-live learning to completely alive. Yeah, that's that's awesome. It's kind of that you can look at the Chinese proverb again, like involve me and I understand. And it's so easy to forget techniques, but when you, that you just learn or, or you get demonstrated to you. But if you could pull them off on somebody, it's like, you know, yeah, I, I'm pretty bad about the sweep. And then I'm training with Gary and, and it happens to, to work out for me. I'll remember that sweep. Man, that worked out great. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, there was a little bit differently. Of course, it didn't, nothing happens like perfect, but he he presented some sort of a of a defense to it, and I had got around that or something like that. But um, it feels really good to to perform a, a technique that you had just learned recently, and part of that feeling is because you possibly added something new to your game, and. It, it doesn't. You don't get the same feeling when you just get shown a technique because you're not really. You know, after you've been training for a while, you know that these aren't added to your game. You're just getting some exposure to techniques. You have to. You have to be able to perform them to add them to your game. And uh, I think that's right. If if you could just get a little bit of that positional sparring or a little bit of that uh, focus training towards what you learned today, that's a great way to to peak um, your your or get a better shot at, at remembering something and it could maybe the class doesn't do it i think that's it's it's a fairly i don't think it's a super common thing is we we you know show armbar very from guard today and then we drill and then we spar i think that's pretty common but but it would be good to do armbar and then if you could sit like five minutes of of guard work where you have posture control or maybe your armbar set up or something like that or maybe at the end of class, you grab your, you, you know, make a, a training partner buddy, and you say, "Hey, let's work on these that we did today already. Let's get position and work on that." That should up your game. I think one one thing that we have here on the list is go deeper in the techniques that you're already good at, and that's I think what you did, Joe, when you made that list. Yeah, don't don't start from zero. Um, oftentimes, I think what happens is you get good at a technique, and then. Uh, your training partner's defense catches up and it's easy to say sort of just put that on the shelf it's not working anymore but uh there's always details and um you know other options that you can explore you can always get better at something take take that brick and make it even bigger and better i like that joe like i always say that you know let's say i i pass byron's guard and i'm looking for a kimura and byron defense and, you know, that may be my number one path there. And, you know, I've been hitting it a lot. And then all of a sudden, uh, Byron defends like five times in a row. I used to get down a little bit. And it's like, oh, darn, you know, maybe I need to go to another move. But now I look at it as a challenge. You know, I look at it that, hey, uh, you know, Byron has, you know, beat me now. And he's not letting me finish this. So now I need to find another way to get this to work. And, uh, that has really helped my game just kind of turning it into, uh, to uh, a game that, Hey, I'm going to figure out how to, uh, another way to catch Byron, uh, another way to, uh, to, you know, destroy his defense and, uh, you know, put me back on top. And that's helped me out a lot, you know, just digging deeper into what I'm good at. And, you know, even after, you know, but there's normally more than one way to skin a cat, and it's just, <laughs> <laughs> from the That's top from the problem. bottom of my carry. <laughs> but it's like, uh, you know, hey, you stopped my first way and, you know, you put a wall in front of me and, you know, I'm not going to go through the wall. I'm going to go around it and find another another avenue uh, or as Byron likes to say, another way to skin the cat. So uh, uh, I like that one. Go deeper into uh, into your uh, into your move. So you will experience that. You get good at something, and then everybody starts to defend it uh, a little more effectively, and it's not so good anymore. Think of it like a little bit of an arms race. You could, you know, you could move on to something else, or you can get a little bit better at it, and get in the same situation where you're, where you're ahead of them a little bit again, and then and then they'll catch up, and and this sort of thing happens a little back and forth, and and the growth is maybe a little slower after you've kind of initially introduced the technique to everybody, like when. I started really falling in love with leg drags, leg, uh, leg drags. I was leg dragging everybody I trained with almost. And now it's really hard to pull a leg drag off on anybody I train with. My leg drags haven't gotten worse. Everybody else has gotten better. 
But when I when I run into somebody who I don't train with regularly, they they're not exposed to that leg drag the same way that that everybody else is. And and I've talked about how to how to defeat my leg drag pass and and given a lot of answers away and and and, and that, so my pass has gotten better. But when somebody is not used to defending it, it's not that hard to do. <laughs> it's it's pretty simple. So just just think of okay, I'm hitting a bit of a of a hurdle here. It's a higher hurdle than 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 the first initial. Uh, start to this technique, but if you can clear that one, you may run into people who are still at the uh, at the first hurdle, and it'll be really easy to apply this technique too. I just it just it's, it it feels like an arms race because it kind of is, but a lot of times when you go train with somebody, uh, they're so far behind the arms race, it, like at a competition. If you get real good at leg locks or you know real good at a, a kimura or whatever, it's like their defense isn't anywhere near your training partner's defense, and that's going to be a great technique for a tournament. Byron, you know, you're talking about arms race and, you know, that's something that really means a lot to Byron. If, if you go into his basement, there's so many guns, mortars, you name it, explosives that, uh, if his house ever catches on fire, it's going to be like world war three. He's got so many arms in his basement. Gary, I thought you were going another direction, man. I thought you were going to talk about those arms that he's packing every day, those 26-inch biceps or whatever he's oh, got there. No, that's more like a, a 22. <laughs> a, P, a, a BB gun? <laughs> a Crossman 760 Power Master. <laughs> the Red Rider BB gun. I uh, I don't even know how... how what a, if a, what a big bicep is. <laughs> like 20 oh, yeah, we can tell. Yeah. <laughs> well, how many inches is this? Like, man, that's a big arm. I don't know. Uh, I think twenty six is is pretty darn big. Pretty pretty darn big. Yeah. Go go measure yours. Like everybody, right now, Byron, measure yours because the average male has twenty six inch biceps. So measure yours and see where you stack up. <laughs> Gary, I actually I'm sitting at my desk. I have a little measuring tape here. Wait. This is weird. I don't know if I can pull this off. That's what she said. Man. <laughs> <laughs> This is bad. I might have 15 inch arms. <laughs> so you're only 11 inches off the average male. There we go. You're, you're over halfway there, buddy. Keep it up. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think they're getting any bigger. Well, I am getting you know, heavier, but Byron, my arms I aren't getting you. any bigger. So, Byron, me and Joe are going to give you a couple tips. Uh, first of all, you need to do <laughs> the AB, You need to do the ABC workout, all bench and curls. And all your curls need to be done in the squat rack. That's my tips for you. You know, that'll help you. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. I could tell it's already working good. All right. Well, we're talking about jujitsu too. <laughs> um, another thing that will help your submission game is just being better at the fundamentals. So we talk about having some specific training, and you know, some some positional sparring, and that sort of thing. But if you're if your fundamentals are kind of lacking, it's going to be hard to get anything to really get much traction. So if if you want to have a good blank from guard, fill anything, submission, sweep, guillotines, kimuras, arm bars, you know, gi choke, whatever. But it's easy to pass your guard. None of them are going to be any good. It's just you have to work on a little bit of retention first. If if you If you can't hold the mount... You're you're not going to be able to submit any measure mount very well, so just just getting some fundamentals, I think, is a is a big part of being able to, to execute other submissions because your your overall framework needs to be at a at a certain level before you could can make things happen. Yeah, if you're still relatively new to jujitsu, first year or so, and you've had some success with a few submissions, and now you're struggling with them. I would say this should be at the top of the list. This is, uh, um, like Byron said, if you if you don't really have a great guard to begin with, you're going to have a hard time hitting submissions from there. Um, if you're trying to do cross-collar chokes from the guard, how you get that grip, how deep you get that grip, I mean, there's so many details and, and, and so much fundamental jiu-jitsu involved there that that's where I would start for sure. One thing watching uh, Gary teach jiu-jitsu is uh, – is he has a lot of solutions to problems that he knows he's going to run into. So G- Gary's amazing at Kamora's, 
amazing at foot lock. So either one of these is, I could talk about, but it doesn't really matter. But he's been teaching my wife a lot about Kimuras because she wants to eventually destroy my shoulders one of these days. And she's getting better and better at it. But uh, Byron, yeah. real quick. Oh, man. It would be harder <laughs> to destroy your shoulders and she's going to attack with those Kimuras if you got your biceps up to regular person size at 26 inches. So uh, just a little tip for you. Okay. I don't know if my leg is that thick. Well, we'll go down to that one later. You know, the average size of a person's leg. Joe, what did you tell me it was the other day? 54 inches? So, something like that. <laughs> no. Yeah. So measure measure your leg, Byron. Yeah, my, my calf is like 17 inches. Uh, the average size of calves, Joe was just telling me the other day, 32 inches. I can't. Why, why do I have a measuring tape by my computer? This has been a disaster. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I was in the middle of giving giving Gary a compliment. <laughs> and some weird voice disguised guy shows up. But this guy Gary I trained with sometimes. He uh he he has answers. So the the, the bullet point here is have answers for common problems. So Gary has a Kimura system and he, he so Gary locks up a Kimura. I have he knows I'm going to do like one of two or three things. And each thing I do, he's encountered it before and he has an answer for that. And and it may be, you know, changing the position slightly or changing the attack or or you know, doing a whole different attack. But he's got answers to all of the common problems that I'm able to present to him. Same thing with, with leg locks. Gary starts off with the ankle. I try to I defend the ankle and I get my other leg over here. He attacks the other leg immediately. It's like, man, that he didn't make that up. That, that that's a thing that he's dealt with a lot. He's trained with it. He knows sometimes uh, the, the person tries to clear their foot with the other foot or something like that, and that foot's open for to attack. You know, I, I remember one time Gary goes to knee bar me, and I tuck my my foot behind my other uh, knee to where my there's no way he's getting my knee out of this thing. He pulled that foot right into position and attacked my other foot. Like. That's a common problem. When so you go to knee bar somebody, they hide that foot behind their knee. He's got the solution for that. So as you and it kind of goes in the category of going deeper into the techniques you're better at. So overall, you want to you want to build a system of of attack. And it's like once Gary gets to attacking my feet or my shoulder, it's I want this thing to be taken apart as quickly as possible. Not my not my body, not my limb, but but Gary's system. I just want to reset to a neutral position. I'm not trying to get anything. I don't want to gain anything. I don't want to, I want to start from ground zero again, just as guard or, you know, just from whatever. So if I could, if I could back out, I would, but usually um, it just gets worse and worse. And he's got more answers than I have uh, problems to present him. And uh, it's a good way to roll. It's a good way to, uh, to, to think about jiu because you know, okay, simple one, you do an armbar from top. The person's holding their hands together. We've all encountered this. We all have a little answer for this. Is it the best answer? I don't know. But you need that sort of an answer for problems for everything. He does a hitchhiker escape. What's your answer for that? Well, I lose position. No, that's not, that's not the good answer. You want to you have a good answer and, and be able to gain from their uh, attempted escape. You, you want to have several uh, solutions to different problems. So I think that's, that's a good way to, to develop your game. And, uh, and you could, you could expect if I could set up a certain thing, you're going to be, you're going to see certain reactions out of your training partners or opponents. But Gary, but Gary, is that, that's kind of how you work though. I mean, even as you're instructing my wife, um, like, like you don't say, here's the Kimura, that's how you finish it. Like, cause she knows that he's going to do this. He's going to roll. He's going to fight his arm back. And it's like, okay, he does that. Then you do this instead, or you move to this ahead of him. And and just you, there's always a, an answer for the problem that I give. Yeah, well, I mean, it goes both ways too. For the defense, there's always, you know, defense to you know your move. So you have to know what that defense is, and you know, this is going into deeper. You know, n- not only just finding answers for common problems, but this goes back to we were talking about go deeper into what you're good at. Um, you know, and that's one thing I do a lot. Of. I don't really. I'm, I have very few moves. I really just train uh, ankles and, and Kimuras with a little bit of everything else. But um, I, you have to have answers. 
you know, both ways, offensive and defensively. That defensive guy is going to have an answer for when you do this. So you better be prepared to know where to go. And that's going to come later on in your game. You know, the brand new white belts aren't going to be at that point. They're going to be at the point, you know, hey, I get to this position, you know, I unhook the grip and I get the submission. And, you know, normally you're just singularly focused on that move at that point. But later on, as you start digging deeper into it, you're going to have answers for, hey, if this guy does this, because a lot of these people are all going to react the same way. Um, it's funny because I have trouble with the brand new person. I, I'll end up putting this move on and they've never wrestled and done jujitsu before. So they don't react like I, they're supposed to. And next thing you know, they go another way and you're like, Oh wait, I don't have an answer for that problem, but that's not something you're going to run into as much. But, uh, you know, as you start digging deeper into your game, into your submission, those answers are going to come and, uh, you know, that's going to really increase your submission percentage, uh, cause it's going to take away all the avenues of escape for your opponent. And the thing about the, like new people is typically your first, uh, attempt works. <laughs> if you, if you wanted to, your first attempt at the Kimura would actually work opposed to having to, to go down, uh, to the third, uh, variation of attack to make it, uh, well, but, but the good part, you know, even new people going normally, like Byron said, that first thing worked. But, man, if you know, you know, the third thing down and, and you know, ways that person's going to react and ways to address it, then we're just getting in deeper, you know, understanding of that move. And you're, you're just going to be awesome. Byron, you're awesome. Joe, you're awesome, too. Well, I appreciate that, Gary. Thanks, man. Who I don't even know who this is anymore. This uh, I do. Gary it's, Guy. Oh, I know who you are. You're that guy with puny arms. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> any other any other training concepts you guys recommend for being able to to do better submissions or, or get a little bit more submissions? Yeah, not not to pump uh, Byron's other audio book, but <laughs> <laughs> not my arms though. <laughs> But uh, really, six games for BJJ, you know, you've got the uh, Nike method in there. Just do it. And uh, if you're having problems hitting submissions, uh, one thing you could try is just going out there and, and attempting every submission you see. Uh, and that's something you actually could work with your training partner on, too. Just tell, hey, this is what I'm doing. And, um, yeah, because tra- training a, a couple of eight or ten minute rounds or five minute rounds and, and getting an attempt every 30 or 40 seconds is uh, you're going to see a lot more than if you're only getting an attempt every five minutes or something. So give that a try. Yeah, that, that's a good one. I think of um, recently in my training, I've been, I've been working a lot on back attacks and it's, it's been a, a real blessing to, to have some lower rank belts around where I don't have a lot of trouble taking their backs to where I could, I could work us through my system uh with with them, you know, if I rolled nothing but black belt rounds, I would get very little time on people's backs, and that's really what I what I want to accumulate. I don't want to just get on the back and, and end it right away either. I want to to really establish good control, get my feet where I want them, uh, do some things with hand fighting, and really kind of get some kind of reps in while I'm on their back. And it's uh, it's an important thing. I remember when when I was learning triangles, my first goal. Uh, when I started to get better at triangle chokes was to get the position and keep it and just work from the position. It's like with Gary, he he's a Kimura. He, he, sometimes he'll, he'll lock up the Kimura and he'll just kind of like, he'll, he'll, he'll work at the position more than just trying to end, uh, end it with the submission because the, the more time, the more minutes to hours you get, working in those in those positions the more you're going to be able to understand and perform so you know if, if you want to get a better triangle don't lock up a triangle and then slam it closed as quick as possible and get the tap as quick as you can that's okay but sometimes get the triangle position and see hey can i keep this person here for a minute for two minutes can this person fight my you know out of this triangle or can i keep him in there for two minutes straight that's a crazy amount of time to be stuck in a triangle don't even be trying to finish it just maintain the position and and deal with all the things they present to you as far as ways to escape. Uh, if you can hold somebody in a triangle for two or three minutes, you could submit them. That's not an issue. Uh, but just kind of just changing a little bit of your your goals 
as far as um, you know, getting that control and, and getting that, that kind of that rep time in. And, and it, when you look at the end of the t- training time, how much time did you get to train? Uh, how much time was spent on the person's back? Was it 30 seconds? I got the choke right away. Or did I get 10 minutes of rolling with 10 different people and I got their back for a minute each? And it was really, you know, th- that's how much time I got to train back attacks. Um, I think, you know, just kind of slowing it down when you get there. And, uh, and and letting the person struggle and work and, and, and maybe escape and then dealing with that. Those are all important things. Back in the day, uh, on Friday nights, me, Byron, and a couple other guys used to get together and we'd go over Ryan Hall's triangle video. And, you know, we would do a lot of positional sparring. But uh, I remember one we used to work on. That I think Byron came up with this idea. We'd start with a fully locked triangle. And it was your... You had to try to get out, and I just remember the next day I couldn't move my head, and uh, we'd work that, and uh, sounded kind of crazy, but uh, you know, just doing all that positional sparring really helped. You know, Byron's triangle, my triangle, D's triangle, all of us said, uh, you know, we're working it, and it helped me better. But uh, you know, we'd put ourselves in some really bad positions, and uh, and offensively it worked because you know, not just defensively for us trying to get out, but offensively, Byron realizes he has to control my posture. If my posture gets up, if you're just so worried about the strangle and uh, not worrying about posture, you know, I'm going to get posture and uh, I have a better chance of escaping. So, uh, like Byron said, just trying it, you know, tr- putting yourself holding somebody in that position and really working it, and, uh, seeing what you need to do, break it down. Yeah, and this I guess this could we're kind of moving into the the uh, performance category as far as when you're oh, actually area that, that's yeah that's an area you're really lacking performance wise <laughs> the 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 effort is there <laughs> 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 I really try but the performance often is uh, lackluster oh we're we're actually not talking about on the mat but that's another <laughs> topical episode <laughs> yeah we're not oh we're talking about jiu-jitsu? Yes. Okay, I I didn't understand. Oh, okay. Yeah, I yeah, this is not so bad. Yeah. Um <laughs> but one thing I think in the performance category and you know, I I think we're all guilty of it sometimes is uh you know, we get to the position, we get the move locked up, it doesn't work right away and we let go. Um you know, I think a lot of times I have the move and you know, I don't hear a gurgle right off the bat, but a lot of times your opponent's opponent is defending. It's going to take you a little while to get under the chin. Um, we're in a good position. That person is in major danger. Um, you know, I've got my hands locked. I'm not a hundred percent under the chin yet, so I don't have a quick strangle, but the way I look at it, it's up to the opponent to defend and get out of that position. If I have that position, keep it, you know, as long as I'm not in danger, um, you know, cause there are, times where if I hold on to a submission a little too long or, you know, somebody could turn that on me. But, uh, you know, let's just say I have a rear naked choke and uh, I'm totally not underneath the chin, but I'm close. Don't just give up, you know, make that person get out of it. And uh, sometimes I think that's a that's a thing is we may give up, you know, too soon. It didn't work right off the bat. And, uh, you know, I know I'm working a lot with Becky there. Uh, and that's one thing I was telling her about the Kimura, um, is, Hey, I've got the grip. I may not be totally threatening yet, but I have the grip. Let's, let's let him try to get out of it. Let's let him or her, you know, get out of this position. My, my job is, you know, if they make a mistake, I'm already halfway in the driver's seat with that grip locked up. So let's keep it and, you know, let's try to get to a better position where I can finish it. And instead of just letting go and get in better position, then try to recapture it. Let's let, you know, our opponent make a mistake and put me in an advantageous position to get the strangle, to get the, to get the break, to get whatever I need to uh, finish this match. Gary, I think that's an awesome point. Uh, I think the other side of that coin, though, is equally valid. Uh, Byron's note here is that giving up too soon or too late, and especially from the guard. Anytime I open my guard to try and uh, uh, execute a submission from that point, I give my opponent an opportunity to pass my guard. And sometimes you get in a situation where you've got a triangle locked up and your opponent is incrementally improving his chances of passing your guard, 
and your chances of finishing with that triangle are going down. And you reach a point where uh, you end up having to bail at the last minute and they end up with the guard pass. And if that's the case, you do not get a second chance at hitting that submission. But if you kind of can recognize where that point is, where it's too late to for you to finish, but you still got time to get your guard back, that's that's where you want to be. And uh, don't miss second opportunities, especially in a training scenario. If you can get three or four attempts in and around, that's far better than uh, holding on to the first attempt too long and end up being crushed and side control the rest of the round. Yeah, it does. I think that's part of uh, getting better at jiu-jitsu is that sense of timing or that sense of when to bail on something or transition to something else versus I got this, you know, this person's not defending this properly. This, this choke is actually working. It just gave it a few seconds. And I, I remember that that was a piece of advice that somebody gave me a, a while back is uh, if you're choking somebody and you think it's not working, you know, if they're not getting out, just give it a little bit longer, give it a few more seconds and see if it, and it's a lot of times, yeah, it, it is working. <laughs> it was working. And uh, and you might be surprised with with just thinking, well, I don't think this is working. A couple more seconds, and a lot of times you'll get you'll surprise yourself with that. Yeah, I watched a, a match last night on Fight to Win. I wasn't paying enough attention to tell you who the two fighters were, but it ended up with uh, uh, one one guy had the other in a bow and arrow scenario for at least a minute at the end of the round, and. You know, after 15, 20 seconds, you're like, well, that guy who's who's being choked, he is so calm and he's so cool. And you get to a point where, well, he, he, he doesn't look like he's in much danger. But the other guy just kept making one small adjustment after another. And, man, if you let somebody keep you in a bad position like that long enough, or we're talking about getting the submission, if you can keep somebody in a bad position like that long enough and keep making adjustments – Eventually, you'll find the right one, and uh, it did end up with end with a tap. Joe, that's a great point. Like, <laughs> I find myself no, that's awesome because I find myself in this all the time. Like, I maybe get put in a bad position, and let's say you know I don't want to break my grip because I'm going to get tapped, but I spend too much time holding onto the grip instead of making small defensive adjustments. While I'm just worried about the grip. The offensive guy is just making one small adjustment after another, and it's pretty soon going to get the tap. And uh, I, I have to tell myself sometimes it's like Gary, get moving. You know, this is not a defense. This is just stalling. Yeah, I need to do something. And uh, but yeah, I, I love that that you were talking about. You're just making a whole bunch of small adjustments, and pretty soon, you know, you went from you know the deep end at ten feet deep to the deep end at twenty foot deep with a whole bunch of hammerhead sharks. Hammerhead shark. Do, 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 do. Hammerhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, man, you know, okay. Uh, yeah. Sharks Earlier. <laughs> made its appearance uh, on episode 303. <laughs> yep. Baby hammerhead sharks. But, hey, Joe, earlier you were talking about fundamentals. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I think about fundamentals they, is, you know, to – our performance to finish a move is lack of control. Uh, you know, that goes back to the fundamentals and, you know, we all want to get taps, you know, getting a tap is, is the best thing, you know, about jujitsu as Joe would say, but we jump into that submission so quick. We just hoping it's going to hit. We leave a lot of space. Our opponent can really move. And next thing you know, he's out and he's on our back. Or as Joe said, our guard is passed. And, uh, you know, now we're, you were on the bottom side mount. One thing, uh, if you really want to get good at submissions is control. We really need to, uh, you know, lock down that position. Like if I'm going for a North South Camorra and I have the grip, I better make sure, you know, he can't get his, uh, get his back to the mat. I better make sure I'm blocking that. I better be taking my knee in the front of his body and either putting it over his arm or if he's not leaving space, I better be smashing his arm up into his body. I want to make it so he can't move. Um, you know, so when you are looking for a move and especially if you're positional drilling, drilling, you're looking for the submission, you know, ask your opponent, Hey, can you move? Uh, what could I do better? Uh, you know, and, and expand on that while you're drilling. You know, we, we think of a submission as a submission and we work on that submission, but there are so many spots up until that tap where, 
you know, it's not just the, the, you know, the choke, we need to control that body. We need to have our hooks in, uh, you know, we can't let our opponent move as our, as your opponent moves and has space that gives them a chance to get out. And then, then we're in a transition phase at that point, which some issues can come off of that. But, uh, we want to finish that first one. We want to have control as Janet Jackson would say. Yeah, I think I think with the control, Gary, in particular, it's in it. Th- that's one that is overlooked with uh, new, newer people. When, when I'm when I'm grappling, I can't do the voice, Gary. <clears throat> when I'm, I get oh, too excited, what are you trying to do? I get I get to uh, just a, a kind of a little more macho thing, man. Oh, okay. The non nasally Byron is what I was trying to pull off. The the, the macho <laughs> voice kind of comes hand in hand with the biceps, Byron. So. Um, yeah. Maybe I have, have, a, my, my I have a little bit. work to do. As you start getting a little more testosterone in your body, it may change. I mean, you may get up to 15 and a quarter inch arms. Nice. Uh, but okay. Lack of control. So I've talked with, with some listeners before about, um, frustrations with, with getting submissions. And one thing came up with somebody who was like, they're able to get mount, but they can't get a submission from mount. They they, they always missed opportunity and, and they get pressing escapes. And I and I said change your goal for a little bit and just hold them out. Just same thing with the triangle choke. As far as get triangle, hold it for a little bit. Get on the back, hold it for a little bit. Get mount, stay there, and and don't take anything for a little while and make the person work because what happens. With, I get mounted all the time by white belts. It's, it's just part of training. It's fun, and, and and I don't even I don't I don't usually breathe heavy. I just relax because I know that most of the the attacks are going to be, uh, like too haphazardly applied, and and the escape is just pulling my arm out before they fall back for the arm all the way. But if I did that to a pro belt, they're taking my arm home with them. I need to so a pro belt gets mounted on me. I got to escape them out. I can't just wait for them to go for the armbar. That doesn't. That's not a good plan. That's not a good plan for anybody. But uh, as if you're a newer person and and you're able to get a good position, keep the good position for a little while and make that person work. Because when when the person works, oftentimes they will make a little mistakes. They will expose themselves more than if you just try to just pull that arm uh, out to get your get your submission. I think. That, Byron, yeah, that is that's great advice. I like what you said. Change your goal for a little while, you know, work on controlling the mount, work on controlling the position, you know, establishing your base there. And, you know, so let's think about jujitsu. We we all want to get the tap. We're all, let's say, new in this game. You know, we're in our first year. We're trying to, uh, to get submissions. And, uh, you know, we're happy if we get a submission. But let's just say we get submissions because we're strong and we're going against guys with puny arms like Byron and we're twisting that arm and we're getting a tap. But our position is terrible. Our control is terrible. Our lack of control is awesome. You know, we have no control on that. And what we all want to do is we want to get better in the long run and is getting a tap right now with bad control, um, going to help me in the long run versus getting less taps, you know, for the next three or four months, getting better at control, but down the road, everything else is just going to fall into place. So don't think of, and I know I've done it. And I know, you know, Byron keeps a slam book of who he's tapped and Joe, he already talked about his too, but (laughs) (laughs) nah, but I'm messing. Um, but (laughs) what I'm really saying is, uh, don't think, you know, think about this in the long run. You're going to be better getting less submissions if you're doing it haphazardly with with no control than, you know, if you get control, you work on your control and you get less submissions now. It's it's not about the now. It's about, unless you're in a tournament, it's about, you know, the long run and, and uh, you know, what's going to happen. And like they always say, jiu-jitsu is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We're going to learn every day. You know, Byron's a black belt. Byron learns every day. Um, Joe and I, we learn every day and it's never going to stop. And, uh, we, you know, Joe and I, we may be a little more seasoned than Byron, but both of us can say we were better than we were last year. And uh, we're going to keep getting better because uh, it's a marathon and we're learning. Yeah. So just, I think just focusing on 
being able to control the person as you apply the submission and not being in some frantic state where it there's a lot of chaos involved with your submission attempt. Complete control. You know, you want to go back for the arm bar. They shouldn't be squirming around. They should they should you should be able to control that person and and look for ways to do that and clean that up. Uh, another big one that I've experienced uh on the positive end is that people have a lack of confidence in the in the technique. It, it, so if I'm rolling with a with the blue belt and they've got a choke, it's pretty tight. It's getting pretty tight. Oh, you know the, the world's closing up on me. They'll just move on. <laughs> they didn't. They don't think that they could tap a black belt, or they don't think that the move is quite good enough. No, the the moves work. It so so just getting that confidence, and the best way to get that is just to keep trying them and, and to and to spend time on the mats. But if if you get I always do the same. If you get on any base back, you have the chance to submit them. It, it, like, and realistically, maybe not anybody, but anytime someone's on my back, I know that I could get choked. <laughs> they may not realize that. They might be a fairly new person, but they hop on my back. I'm like, man, that's a that's a bad spot to be. I need to start defending this thing right now. And I think a lot of people, you know, will will get a great position or get a great attack. And they already know that they're not going to finish it. They already know that it does, it's not going to work because this person always gets out. Get that confidence, and, and it could work. And it, 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 the technique works if you work it correctly. You'll likely be able to apply it. And and just I'm not saying like disrespect uh, someone else's ability to get out of something or or to be able to put up a good defense, but just don't be shocked if when the technique works because. Uh, you've been working on it. And you've put it into your game. You've found solutions to common problems, and uh, you'll surprise yourself possibly, or you'll expect it to work, and it will be even easier. <laughs> Have you guys ever ran into that where you didn't think something was going to work, and of course it didn't work? All the time. Then we're talking about jujitsu, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> All the time in that too, Byron. No, it's, uh, yeah, confidence is very important uh, in your move. It's, I mean, these moves are time-tested. I mean, we're not just making up moves. You know, these moves are, you know, have been used by numerous people, you know, competitions, real life, MMA, um, you know, firefighters. And, you know, they do work, you know, have confidence in them. And, and as you dig deeper into your move, as you have better fundamentals, you know, better control, you know, the moves are going to even work more, you know, they, your training and your performance, they all go hand, hand in hand. And it's just, uh, you know, it's going to lead to confidence, but have confidence in them. Even if you may not be the best at it right now, you know, the move works. You've seen it numerous times on in matches and in, in the gym, um, you know, on the street fight videos. So they do work. Yeah. I think something I know Byron's touched on a lot in this, on this show before is your, your confidence, in the things around the move. In other words, if I fail at this move, what's the worst that's going to happen? And am I confident I can recover from that? So if I'm working from guard and I attempt an arm bar and get my arm passed or my guard passed, how comfortable am I inside bottom side control? And what kind of tools do I have to get back to my guard? And and the more confidence you have in that kind of stuff, uh, the less hesitance you'll have when you're initiating the moves. Joe, very good point there. I like that. I, I didn't even think about that. But, yeah, where are you going to be if this doesn't work? Um, you know, I may be in bottom side control. I may be in half guard. Who knows? But do I have the tools in my tool bag to uh, feel comfortable in that position? So um, uh, I like that. Joe, I think you won the Internet with that one. Uh, the the confidence helps greatly with your timing and your ability to just pull that trigger when it happens. Um, we've all seen grapplers like that. When, when they get that little opportunity, they jump all over that thing. They're they're all over that ankle. They they take that arm bar. They shoot for that double leg, whatever. And we've all seen and experienced our times when when we didn't do that. You know, well, will it work? Will it? And you're thinking, and the opportunity comes and it goes. It's like, man, that was a missed one. <laughs> yeah. And 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 that's part of that ability to have good timing is to also have confidence in your techniques. Pull the trigger. <laughs> triggers a horse gary i'm not so sure that uh applicable there you go <laughs> another thing about being able to get submissions is to uh have a funnel 
for your jiu-jitsu. So have a, have a, have a way to get where you want to be. If, if you want to get on someone's back, you need to be able to do that from the guard. You need to do that from a passing position. You need to be able to find their back when you're on side control or mount. You need to have different avenues uh, to get to their back and do that with everything. So it, if your primary attacking position is butterfly guard, your funnel is pretty simple. You pull butterfly guard and, and you're working within your system and, and the funnel is pretty short. If your funnel uh, ends with you uh, doing a, uh, a choke from mount, your funnel might be a little more complicated to where you need to first you know get on top. So do you pull guard and work for a sweep? To get on top, do you have to pass someone's guard? We'll kind of maybe pass a half guard as well, and then go from side control to mount and transition to that, and, and then work from there. Like that's a pretty big thing, but you need to have different ways to get to mount. And so I think sure. a shorter funnel is is often better. But just just have a funnel and think of it like if I want to work it from this position. That's why I, uh, working my back attacks, I have really benefited from working with some lower rank belts because I can get to the back and then I can start training. Because uh, the, the funnel's a little bit uh, got a little bit bigger opening to to start with. Yeah, and Byron, uh, you were talking about you've been blessed because you have a lot of lower belts to train with, where you can work at it. And you know, I could see somebody who just started saying, "Hey, I don't have anybody lower than me to work with." But you know, that's when we go back to positional sparring. You know, so talk to your, you know, teammate, you know, you have two evenly matched teammates, uh, you know, one's not significantly better than the other. And it's like, Hey, let's, uh, you know, go a little bit slower. Let's work on this. So, uh, just because you may not be, have a lot of people below you in your room doesn't mean you can't, uh, can't do kind of like what Byron was talking about. You just need a, uh, uh, a, a training partner who's there to help you get better there also who, and who will, uh, work a little bit slower if need be. Great advice, yeah, this Gary. Is, this, Did I win the internet? A, no, I already won it today. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have the confidence, one, Gary. Only, you don't ask. Only, you just tell. Only Joe's hardcore. <laughs> Joe's hardcore. Hey, Byron, you were talking about, you know, butterfly guard, you know, funnel into the position, you know, and being able to get butterfly guard for all, from all positions. So let's say I have mount on you, but I need to go butterfly guard. Should I just pull you up out of my into my butterfly guard? No, in in theory, you you would have. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, at that point, you're working on your mount game. <laughs> You've used your butterfly to sweep and then probably get mount. Yeah. But I, but, I but just... if if you have mount on me, I would be shrimping and getting my knees back in and and, and then working my butterfly, opposed to trying to roll you and getting on top and like, okay, now where's my funnel to butterfly? I'm on top, and I got to, you know, that's really not going to work out for me. So just have avenues. I think that's like, look at Bernardo Freya. He's got so many ways to get to to his system of, of, of deep half. No matter what position he is, he's within a few seconds away from being a deep half guard. Man, what a tough person to compete against because he's all, as soon as he's in deep half, he's winning. <laughs> he's yeah. doing great. What a, what a great position. What a, what a great system he's developed uh, to have such uh, performance with his jiu-jitsu. I think this is a great point, but I, I think getting to the positions, just kind of half of the funneling process, once you get to the position, um, eliciting the response that you want out of your opponent is sort of the second half of that. So, um, you know, di- di- a different guard, depending on where you grip, where you pull is going to elicit the response you want. So if you want to, uh, the guy pressuring towards you because you're going to use his momentum for a sweep. Uh, you'll do something different than if you're ho- trying to get him to stand up or trying to get him to move away. So understanding that part of the game is sort of the second piece of this puzzle. Yeah. Um, you know, Byron, I like what you were talking about, you know, funneling in and, you know, the people are really good at it. And it just made me think the other day uh, I was watching uh, Gary Tunnan's, uh, uh last MMA fight and, uh, he ended up with a single leg on a guy and, you know, really from there, he just dove right into his leg lock, uh, from the single leg. He, you know, it, there was no trip. There was no run into pipe. It was just straight to, uh, straight to, uh, you know, he kind of like rolled over into, a uh, belly down, uh, looked like a straight ankle lock and then switched over to a, uh, a heel hook. And, uh, it's just incredible. You know, these people who have, the people who are really good, like you were talking about Bernardo Faria, they have 
their system and, and they get into their system. And, you know, here, here, what really, I really liked watching was Gary getting into that system off of a single leg, you know, and normally I think you get the single leg, you get the takedown, you go to side control, but you know, he's in the single leg and he went straight, you know, for the attack which, to his bread and butter. And uh, it was, it was fun to watch. It was awesome. Yeah. Look, look at Ryan Hall's system uh, with, with his transition to MMA like he's able to to do some interesting stand up things like with kicks that people wouldn't do because he would get taken down too easily. So he's throwing out these interesting kicks, and and if he is getting hit, he he changes level by dropping and rolls <laughs> for the legs. Like, Goes for the inner warrior. Yeah. What, what an interesting uh, system he's developed. But it, it, it's a quick funnel to attacking the legs. That's how you are able to to submit BJ Penn very quickly is because the, the funnel is very short. And, and and within a few seconds of, of engaging on the ground, he's in uh, Ryan's system. And, uh, you know, we all can't develop that overnight. But <laughs> we can learn from that and just how quickly can you get someone into your funnel? And then, uh, like, how wide is your funnel? How many different areas can you can you can you pull someone into that system? Yeah. How wide is your funnel, Byron? Um. You know, I I don't even know how to dignify that or, or how to answer that without uh, making it worse. I mean, I feel like if I yeah. say I have a small funnel, it's that's embarrassing. <laughs> if it's a huge funnel, man, what has been happening here? I don't know, Gary. <laughs> okay. Well, well uh, can, can you measure it right now? It <laughs> At the moment, I can't even Byron's find it. Byron's the only guy At I the... know that walks around with a tape measure. <laughs> Gary, at the moment, I can't even find it, okay? So measuring it's kind of tough. <laughs> Oh man, but, but it gets in the tool bag. Man, yeah, man, I really enjoyed this topic today, and and I think this is something that we've all run into. We, and uh, it's I think it'll really help a lot of people. Uh, you know, let's have confidence. Let's work on positional sparring. Let's have some focus. Um, let's work on our fundamentals, and and don't give up too soon. But uh, don't give up too soon. Confidence and control, and let's funnel you know, our opponent into our, into our, uh, into our funnel cloud, into our, where our positions are. Great sum up there, Gary. Did I win the internet? I, I, I am not the, uh, the judge on that sort of activity. Joe, did I win the internet? He already told you no. You're usually the judge on that. So you make the call, man. No, Joe won it. Yeah. Yeah. Joe's already won it. You're a close second. Yep. Yep. (laughs) But if you think somebody, if you're training, one of your training partners or your buddies would enjoy the show, please share it with them and let them know. Um, it's kind of a subtle way of telling them why they're not getting any submissions. <laughs> <laughs> this episode would be great for you because you can't land a submission. <laughs> no, uh, it's probably a better way to present that than than that way. But you know, have fun with it, and uh, if it would help anybody out, yeah, especially teammates of yours, share it with them. And that's a tremendous honor when people share the podcast and and. Uh, means a lot to us. Helps us grow as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the more people you share it to, the higher percentage of people listen to us. And, uh, you know, that makes me think about our article of the week, you know, talking about percentages. And, Byron, what do we got for the article of the week? We have uh, an a article from highpercentagemartialarts.com. And uh, it's titled, I watched 100 white belt matches. Here's what's actually high percentage. And so this, this is a great website. Um, this guy's uh, awesome. Yeah, I was looking around for articles, and I, I found one that was kind of uh, – the article before this, I found it was it was one long paragraph about how jiu-jitsu is ineffective. And I'm like – like in the street fights, I'm reading it. So I'm like, this isn't even – first off, it's not really what we're trying to do here, but he's, he clearly has never trained. He's just kind of – you know, he'd rather do striking, and that's fine, but he's just trying to bad mouth jiu-jitsu and i'm like man this isn't really gonna work looking around a little more articles and this popped up I'm like this is gold mine <laughs> this is a great article yeah. uh, i, I go as far anybody who's a white belt and wants to compete you need to go read this <laughs> this yeah. is awesome and you know re, you know listen or not listening but uh reading this article not only did he watch 100 white belt matches the matches he watched he made sure he watched the whole thing so i mean it's not just he watched parts of it or whatever but can you imagine here's a guy who takes the time to watch a hundred white belt matches the whole match like that's a lot of time a lot of data is in this and uh you know this 
I mean, this is incredible information. I mean, you know, you talk about data analytics and business, you know, but here this guy is taking it to the sport of jujitsu and, uh, you know, just, you know, the proof is in the pudding. It tells you what's working, what's not working. And uh, I, I, I love this article. Yeah. What's the, so th- this article single handedly is going to change the way I coach. Uh, definitely white belts, maybe, maybe, you know, blue and purple as well. But um, Joe, anything stand out? pretty striking right from the beginning well i have mixed feelings about some of this Um, (laughs) all right so so let's start with it's all about guard passing i i would i would say that's pretty valid but i i don't know if the fact that when 100 white belts are rolling guard passing may predict the winner and that may be because guard passing is a more valuable skill at that level or it may be because what you're seeing is just a a a big gap in skill levels the one guy that's passing the guard is just a much better grappler at white belt is the is the one belt where you could have a guy with eight months of grapple or eight months of jujitsu experience and eight years as a uh, offense or a defensive linebacker or four years of high school wrestling or something else in his past that makes him a far better athlete. So, um, yeah, seven years of hopscotch, something like that. I mean, God, (laughs) your, uh, your footlock defense would be on fire if you had seven years of hopscotch, um, experience. I, I guess all I'm saying is, um, it's an interesting article, but I'm not sure about some of I don't know how to read into some of the conclusions. Sorry to derail your... No, I... I okay, but it, it, that's that same little paragraph says, there's no silver bullet in the matches, but guard passing was a single greatest indicator of success in a match. Among the winners, 65% of them passed the guard. That's a pretty so, big number, but, but maybe just the ability to play top... What, what was the bigger yeah. deal you're saying? Well, but if you ever want to play yeah, top yeah, and you the, can't pass the guard, you're not getting anything out of this. Yeah. But, I mean, then it goes back to the next paragraph. I mean, you know, guard passing 65% won. Submission rates are bad, but from the bottom, they're abysmal. So, I mean, you know, you get the takedown, you pass the guard, you, you use your fundamentals, you control top position, game over. So does that mean you shouldn't uh... – be working your submissions from bottom as much if you're a white belt or no i mean no let you want to just yeah let let me just throw this back at byron when you say this is going to change your coaching a little bit uh in what ways so good question uh i so joe hold on hold on hold on joe you did win the internet (laughs) again for that question i mean that's a very valid question and uh, you know i i love that question just trying to get this train wreck wreck back on the rails. <laughs> so I actually I went I, I watched the jiu-jitsu tournament this weekend and and did some coaching that sort of thing, and a lot of the competitors have a guard plan. I think everybody has, unless you you come with a wrestling base, you, you have some attacks from guard you're comfortable with and you want to try to do. But you also see it in the person's face when they end up on top, they end up stuck in somebody's guard, and it, it's like. They want they want to pass a guard and they try throw the legs or whatever and, and and just get through the legs is difficult. I I think that when we're teaching guard techniques, they they realize if I want to choke Gary, I can't just take my hands and put them on his neck and apply pressure. That doesn't work. I need to to set up a guillotine. I need to set up a collar choke. I need to set up a a triangle choke. Some kind of a technique to make this choke work particularly at white belt levels, when they want to pass the guard, they just want to be in side control. It's the same equivalent to wanting to just strangle somebody with your hands. Like, give me around these stupid legs. They're in my way. I can't attack this person yet. I, so I, I, I'm going to stress more of, of instructing and demonstrating and training with uh, the white belts on do a particular type of guard pass. Do it over under. Do a double under. Do a, a knee slice. Do a leg drag. Teach some guard passes to where they're not just trying to get around. Because white belts, by definition, don't have the best guards in the world. So sometimes you could just pass their guard because they make a mistake. So they're they're competing with people who do this. But you need to be able to pass a white belt guard who is almost a blue belt. 
If you can't do that, you're going to run into some problems because the person who wins the white belt tournament is almost a blue belt, and they have an almost a blue belt style of guard. So you need to be able to have a type of guard pass that you that you have steps to to execute. You go step one, control the hip. Step two, you know, you get your knee here, whatever, and you finish like this. These types of guard passing are much more effective than the typical um, get around the legs type of a guard pass that you see a lot in white belts. And, and a lot of times it's just the person fails to do a good guard and they end up getting their own guard passed. Um, that's, that's I think, the most glaring thing I would teach differently to uh, white belts is what's your guard pass? Just ask them, let's see your guard pass. And if it's if it equivalents to them just having to run around the legs or just throw them or hope they fail an arm bar or fail a triangle and then pass that, like those aren't acceptable answers anymore. You need to have a guard pass. Let's work on it. See, that that's a great uh, takeaway from this. But it also brings up another unknown in this. Of all the guard passes, how many of them were guard passes that uh, you would consider that's a guard pass? And how many of them, given the abysmal success of submissions from the bottom, how many of them were just um, opportunistic opportunistic uh, failed uh, submission, submission from the attempts? Bottom. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Joe, one thing I, I started thinking, too, while Byron was talking, because, you know, normally when Byron talks, he kind of puts me to sleep. So I was thinking of something else. <laughs> Sorry, Gary. But uh, but they talk about submissions from the bottom. Success rate, 15.79 percent. Failure, 84.21. And, you know, and then Joe talks about, you know, there were probably a lot of those guard passes were off of that 84 percent failure rate. Um, you know, it goes for a arm bar from the guard misses everything. And next thing you know, you're in side control. But so I look at it also that boy, maybe as you know, Byron, you're saying you, we need to work guard passing, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, boy, maybe we really need to work on our arm bars from the bottom. Maybe we would work on our guillotines from the guard. Maybe we need to work on, you know, our Camorras from the bottom. It's like, cause you know, that failure rate's pretty high and it's probably leading to some, uh, you know, guard passing there too. So, uh, I think about it as if I get a better arm ball from the guard, my success rate, you know, let's say I bring it up to 45%. Um, you know, that's a very good success rate right there. I'm going to get past less, but, uh, I see a lot of opportunity, uh, to get better on the bottom because we are going to be on the bottom. Uh, there's no essential buts. There's going to be people that are going to take us down and, uh, we're going to get put on the bottom. So, uh, we can't just neglect that because, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there and, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a high failure rate and we don't want that high failure rate. We need to plug the dam up. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting to look at. It's just, we could, we could make a whole or we could make a whole, uh, topic, uh, topical episode on this. You know, I think what'd be awesome is, Byron, try to get a hold of this guy and see if we could talk to him, see if we That'd could have fun. an interview. With this yeah, guy. he'd be a great this, interview. This guy is awesome. Yeah. And, and yeah. so regardless, I think you're doing yourself a good service, whether you're a coach or a white belt, to go and look at these numbers and see what's happening because he's got it broke down by different submissions as well. Like, it, it, Umber from top is overwhelmingly the most effective submission as far as uh, numbers-wise is coming at you. So if you don't know how to escape Umber from top, you you might end up with some problems versus if you're worried about getting uh you know Ezekiel or flying triangle which are on here those are less likely statistically to hit you so uh just just kind of a good way to to look at what's happening here and this would be interesting to also look at different weight classes but hey, this guy's already done a ton of work <laughs> cool it's a really cool article i think I agree. One thing that's interesting, and it makes me wonder if some of this isn't a little bit cyclical, too, depending on what's kind of in vogue in the jiu-jitsu community. He's got a short little paragraph about uh, missing an action, and he notes that there's a couple submissions that we would consider pretty basic fundamental parts of jiu-jitsu that really weren't there at all. The arm triangle was only attempted twice out of 100 matches that he watched, and neither were successful. The Kimura from bottom, only two attempts, and neither were successful. And there were zero straight foot locks. So um, I find that interesting. And like I said, I wonder if it's cyclical. Seems like when I was a white belt, everybody was doing Kimuras and triangles. Yeah, um, yeah, it does. Um, in the arm triangles, I, I, I see white belts trying to do this from guard, like from the bottom on guard. That doesn't really work too well. Uh, I think of arm triangle as a top position uh, attack, yeah. 
and uh, it didn't specify, but ne- none of those happened. So <laughs> none of those worked nope. anyway, but really cool article. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. Go check it out. Another thing you should be checking out would be our uh, big BJJ Break event, June 14, 15, and 16 in Wichita, Kansas. I'm excited. It's just around the corner, guys. It is. I'm looking forward to getting back to the uh, vacation destination of America. Uh, looking forward to seeing both you guys and uh, uh, looking forward to our two guests. We're going to have uh, Samir Shantri and Gina Franson are going to be there and looking forward to learning from those two awesome instructors. Yep, and Shamir and Gina have both been on the show before, so go and check out our previous episodes and uh, give them a listen. Awesome episodes. But uh, you can sign up at foxfitnessbjj.com. Jake Fox and Kim Fox, thank you both for uh, hosting this event. Uh, We appreciate it. And, uh, you know, go uh, check him or go sign up foxfitnessbjj.com before it is sold out. And once it gets sold out, even Byron doesn't have enough pull to get you in. So uh, (laughs) make make sure to get your tickets now. I mean, these would not make great uh, uh, Christmas gifts because it is June 14th through 16th, Wichita, Kansas, Fox Fitness, BJJ Brick event. Yeah, I don't have enough pull because my arms are too skinny, Gary. So, uh, well, that's why you need to, as Joe Joe <laughs> talked about it earlier, you need to do curls in the squat rack. <laughs> but uh, so uh, somebody asked me at the uh, at, at the tournament I was uh, attending uh, the other day if, if they can just do one day. Absolutely. And get a hold of Jake. He does have some single day events, but we're hoping to see most of you guys for all three days. Um, and so Saturday is the big day with Samir and Gina. And then uh, the BJ Brick crew is going to be teaching some stuff on Sunday. I don't know how, uh, if you guys want to show anything, I know I'm definitely doing some back stuff, some back attack things. And Joe, you know, Gary's seen a lot of my uh, back attack things I've been working on, but I, I could, I can promise you, Joe, when you go back home, your, uh, your ability to attack the back will be stronger. <laughs> man, we're, we're gonna man, be man. Really drill, we're going to yeah. be drilling some things. We're going to be uh, doing lots of getting lots of reps in. We're going to be taking I the back. Wait. We're going to be finishing and, um, and and really just trying to make this uh, like we talked about today. We'll help you get that funnel. We'll help you, you know, get your finishes. And and that's really I'm excited about Sunday. Yeah, I can tell you my very first seminar or maybe not my first seminar I ever did was with Byron. He did a uh, triangle seminar and, uh, Byron is really, what I like about your seminars, Byron, you do a lot of drilling, um, which then goes back to our, to our proverb, uh, involve me. I understand. And, uh, you know, I always come away, uh, uh, with a lot of good stuff. And, uh, you know, last year you taught the framing one and I, I know I've talked about it many times for me, framing was a lost art. Um, I, you know, kind of, it's something that kind of went away. Joe's talking about the flavor of the month or, you know, cyclical, you know, it's like, you know, I I would learn framing and for some reason I wasn't framing like I should. And, uh, you know, I was getting past and everything. And as soon as I went back to framing, you know, my game has, you know, become much more dynamic. People aren't passing. And, uh, you know, it's just one thing I missed and it it was due to, you know, you could have just shown a frame and talked about it, but you know, all the drilling, uh, made a big difference so thank you but uh june 14th through 16th i can uh make sure you're in wichita kansas guys real quick want to give a mention about patreon uh, if you want to support the podcast there's a link about patreon in the show notes we mail out a, a five inch bgj brick gee patch and a sticker as well uh, really appreciate our patreon supporters that we have uh we're short on time this morning. <laughs> we got to wrap yeah, some stuff up. Real, I get rolling, guys. Yeah, real quick. We know it's a five-inch key patch because Byron always carries a <laughs> carries a ruler, uh, you know, around with a tape measure. So uh, we know it's a five-inch key patch. There we go. It I, it is measurable. Gary, Gary knows it's five-inch key patch because Gary has measured it against other things that he also knows is five inches. That's another way to uh, ensure that something is five inches. Or if yep. it's like, yeah, or like if you only have it, you could measure it twice, like, you know, measure it at a halfway point, then remeasure it again. That also works. But stay <laughs> sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to do curls in the squat rack. Train hard, train smart, get better, guys. We'll see you on the mat. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do 
Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.